sponsored and hosted by world's greatest, some of the world's greatest athletes included on the show, one of them being your host, Devin Allen, two-time U.S. Olympian, um, four-time U.S. champ in the 110-meter hurdles. Um, and we got Bob, producer Bob, back, back. back with us again. I'm back, Dev. <laughs> hey, he's in front of the camera, hey. behind the camera, hey. on the side of the camera. He's, he's going to be running the show as well as being one of our hosts today. Um, we got a pretty good schedule today. We're going to finish up our interview that we didn't get to finish on our last show last week um, on Thursday with Rosie Brennan. And then we have a special guest back on the show, Logan Sankey, um, our ski jump. You could say our now ski jump Continental Cup champion. Um, so she'll True. be on. She'll be on the show uh, in probably about 30 minutes or so. So, Bob, how's it going? Man, a wild and woolly day. A great weekend. We had an amazing event on Saturday. I think everyone's uh, response was like, that was a really cool event. You know, two hours. For, for everyone who didn't see it, uh, Devin was our co-host. We had Billy DeMong hosting. It was a an official Continental Cup event live from Park City, Utah. You can see it on our YouTube channel. I just uploaded it shortly ago, so um, you can check it out there. But yeah, I mean, it was a super exciting event. On Thursday, we're going to have Taylor Fletcher on. So okay. Taylor was supposed to come today, and I don't think I'm giving up any secrets because I think it already happened. They had a surprise party for him, so oh, okay. so he couldn't make it. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and and that's the good thing about the show um it being live and on fan fest um during the live stream on saturday we were able to to bring in like a whole bunch of guests that we didn't necessarily had have planned and we we're able to interact with the fans um the fans gave us some much needed info on you know hometowns and some of the competitors which is good as well so this platform is very very cool um gives us the opportunity as hosts to to interact with fans and interact with people watching it and people that, you know, are watching it live, which, which makes it very cool in the sense that, you know, you get the best experience if you do watch this live. Although we appreciate you watching it after the fact, you know, a rerun is, 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 is good as well. Hey, we'll take that too. You know, we, this show is really interesting because we, um, we shot a bunch of recorded a bunch of segments with Rosie Brennan. So Rosie, is a two-time Olympian. We're going to have her on live because I think you and her have will have a lot to talk about. But she, um, we pre-recorded this before she went back to Europe. She's still in Europe competing now, heading back to Alaska after that. But um, but we have a couple of different pieces here to, to kind of share. Do you, Devin? Do you want to kind of dive right in? Is that what you're kind of thinking here? Yeah, let's let's, let's give people that are watching for the first time that maybe didn't watch the last episode a little Rosie Brennan background. Um, she is a uh, you, what you call it cross country skiing, although you know some of the events are called sprint, um, which is still right. a long distance but shorter than some of the traditional like 10k events. Um, she's from Salt Lake City, Utah. She actually lives and trains in. Anchorage, Alaska now, um, two-time Olympian from the 2018 and the most recent 2022 um, Olympics in Beijing. And then the 2018 is was Pyeongchang, I believe. Um, and yeah, yeah so she's, she's an amazing athlete. Um, some of the things we talked about in the last show, which, you know, this would be a good place to, you know, if you're watching this live, continue watching. But if you're watching a rerun, go to the last show and kind of get the comparisons between track and field and cross country skiing, like in the sense of a distance runner and how similar the training is kind of the, the um, different energy systems that they train, you know, doing two days like a distance runner would do and, and getting on the skis and actually running in the off season, right. When it's, there's not a lot of snow, you know, those athletes actually run for, for training as well. So it's very cool to see the parallels in those two, those two, uh, you know, events, whether it be cross country skiing and long distance running as well. So very cool insight that she has on that. And just, you know, cool insights in general on on what it think what it takes to be the greatest. Um, you know, we talk about this being, you know, a show by the world's greatest and some of the world's greatest athletes in the world. Um, and kind of the mindset that's needed in order to accomplish that. You know, whether it be all the sports we've had on, um, track and field, football, ping pong, or just being great in your everyday life. You know, there's a certain mindset you have to have 
um, some discipline incorporated in that and just, you know, enjoying what you do. So she has a lot of really good insight as well on those things um, that you can check out those answers to those questions in the last episode. We got a few more questions that we asked, um, you know, we pre-recorded and then we're going to go let run um, on this segment today. So, yeah. So, in, so in this one, Deb, let's do the, why she became a cross country skier first. So we'll do that yeah. one first. Okay. So we'll play it down when it comes on the screen. Robbie is going to uh, click on the sound for the restreams, but you uh, at home now, you can also click on it here. You, you're kind of in full control here on fan fest. And if you so, don't want to hear me, you can mute me. <laughs> There we go. Let's let's go back. Let's find why cross country. Yeah, that's the one. Here we go. There we go. It's interesting. So, so I grew up in parts of the U.S. So I grew up in parts of the U.S. Very you know renowned Alpine destination, and Alpine was rules there for sure. And so that was like you know the activity that my parents that we did as a family, like growing up on the weekends. We all went to the resort and we went Alpine skiing, and that was just like the way of life in Park City. Um, and still is to the most part. Um, and I like my parents always offered to sign me up for a ski team and, um, you know, pursue ski rate, Alpine ski racing. And I was just never interested. And I really don't know why it still puzzles me to this day. Um, cause I'm a very competitive person, but it didn't interest me. And, uh, eventually in middle school, like I kind of ended up in, I mean, you know, it's awkward <laughs> middle school years. I think everyone has that kind of like, who am I question? Um, and I was kind of at this crossroads where I didn't have many activities going on uh, and it was the winter and I, I'm definitely an energetic person. And so I think I was just driving my mother crazy. And so she was like, I don't care what activity you pick, but you have to pick an activity for this winter. <laughs> and she um, just kind of kept suggesting like, you, you should try Nordic skiing. Like, I think you might like it. And, um, you know, of course you never want to do what your parents tell you to do. So I was like, kind of like dragging my feet. And finally I was like, okay, fine. I'll try, I'll try the cross country team. Cause I don't have any other ideas. Uh, and it was a perfect fit. Like, I mean, moms do know best, it turns out. <laughs> and, um, I just loved it. And I think what I love about it is, um, well, I think I was meant for, like, I definitely just have more of an endurance sport, I don't know, personality and probably physiology too. And so that just like that aspect really clicked. Um, but what I loved about cross country was that it brought that kind of like joy of, uh, gliding freely on the snow that like I loved in alpine skiing as well but it brought the endurance aspect to it so i got to like feel the joy of of just like having speed on snow um and just like being able to enjoy winter which was such a big season um in my life and so but it it put that endurance component so there was like this element of of um like work that had to get put in um just like aerobic work and I really liked that. Like I could really see, to me, it was very linear. Like, okay, I do this training and I get faster. And of course that's true with any sport, but like for some reason it, in, in the endurance world, it just like that part clicked. Like I could see like, okay, I practice this more, like my heart and lungs get stronger and you know, then I'm faster and like I can improve my technique and I can get stronger and all these things. And it just made sense to me. So um, it was just really a great fit. And I think, I mean, I'm so glad that, that all happened because what I love the most, like, I mean, obviously I'm an endurance sports fan, but what I prefer over cross country skiing to like running or biking or other endurance sports is that we really get the best of like all of the sports because you only have, you only have snow for so many months of the year. So like the summer you still like, we put in tons and tons and tons of training, but like, cause there's no snow, I get to do all these other sports as my training. Like we just have Cross, cross training is our training so I run and I bike and I mean we have roller skis which is kind of our specific training um but I get to do all these other sports and it's also all outside which I love like I couldn't imagine being a swimmer because um I like just love being in the mountains and that's like so freeing to me and so to have to call that my job and for that to be part of my lifestyle just definitely like continued my trajectory with cross country skiing because it was also just my happy place and the things that I wanted to go do with my friends. And so, um, it, yeah, everything just clicked and, and it's really, um, it's yeah, all the things I love in life. So <laughs> into one sport. So I really, I think it's a wonderful sport that everyone should try. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's interesting. So I grew up in parks. So Dev, how much do you love training? 
she sounds like she really loves the whole thing. The better parts of the sport. I mean, obviously the competition is what we're training for, but I do, I do really enjoy training. I like, you know, getting better at something, getting stronger, you know, in the weight room and, and, uh, you know, technical stuff on the track, whether it be hurdling or, or sprinting and stuff like that as well. And when I played college football, it was the same way, you know, a lot of, a lot of football players, especially with like dread practice, but like, you know, the importance and how much, like how much better you can get during the training aspect of a sport, like far outweighs any competition, right? Like, right. Obviously you have to do the competition because that's where, you know, medals are won for second place and the game is played. But the training, that training aspect is, is really fun. And if you can learn to enjoy it and learn to like find, you know, it's very, learn to find that it's very important, then you're going to be a successful athlete, which it seems like Rosie, you know, she's talking about getting the cross train as part of the training as well is like a fun thing for her, you know, it switches it up a little bit. And, and like she said, she kind of tried Alpine. You know, which I didn't realize too, like all the ski, like all the skiing competitions all have different skis too. Like it's like a different, a whole different thing. So Alpine is similar to cross country, which is similar to ski jumping. And, but like, they're all different avenues of skis and boots and stuff like that. Obviously it's so different um, that she was able to kind of try those two things. And she realized she liked the cross country um, side of it, which is, which is pretty cool. And the other thing that's interesting, I, I just noticed in her bio, she's she went to Dartmouth, and so did uh, Logan. I think she's. I think Logan's, Logan's currently still there. there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then you know, all of this stuff. I love contacts, right? So the image that we have as our background here is Park City. The event was in Park City on Saturday. That's where Rosie's from. You know, so I guess it's just kind of in your DNA. You, if you're growing up right there in the mountains, or your uh, backdrop. I mean, that's right. I mean, that, that's, that's that's like having me having a ball field behind my house in Michigan, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of like I'm in San Diego right now for a spring break training. And, you know, I'm I'm at the beach every day, which, you know, if you're in San Diego, you're probably you probably learn how to surf and like play beach yeah. volleyball and and, you know, all those kind of like sunny summery sports uh, as well. So, you know, it's kind of nature versus nurture, you know, um, that old that old saying was where it's like, Hey, you're born in steamboat Springs or park city. You're probably going to be our next, you know, Olympic winter Olympic athlete. It's dude. It has to be per capita. This has to be the most Olympians in the winter Olympics, maybe in the world. In all Olympics. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And all, all we need to figure that out. Right? I mean, there's probably, there probably is a stat, you know, like a lot of basketball players come from the, from the Midwest and East coast and, you know, football is like Florida, Texas, California. Yeah. I'm sure there's like a stat that says like there's but, 46. But one, that. but one town, two towns. Like yeah. the, this is crazy. It well, is. I think too, it's like you said, it's like the nature versus nurture. The parents, the parents are getting parents these, kids, too. these yeah. kids are getting, getting, you know, getting these kids into the sport early, which is a great opportunity. And, you know, we talked, talked to Billy about, you know, raising awareness. And we talked to uh, Benji, Benji, you know, like yeah. a couple of weeks ago talking and he was trying to raise awareness for the the ski sports, especially that, you know, take a little bit of money for equipment and, you know, get, get that stuff for the Jamaican athletes, because I'm sure, like he said, there's, there's plenty of athletes that are capable of doing yeah. these events. They just don't have the opportunity. So it's, true. Um, it's very, it's very, it's very cool. That initiative, that initiative um, that Benji's doing. And then, you know, just seeing all the athletes from the specific areas that, you know, are doing successful like Park City and, and Steamboat Springs. So one of the questions I asked, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this one in here. I asked Rosie, what's, you know, one of her favorite cities that she's gone to and that kind of stuff and talking, maybe talking about food. Uh, but she had a really funny story that we didn't get in last time, which kind of goes to the, you know, like, nature versus nurture kind of so i'm just gonna i'm gonna roll this clip about her uh travels here here we go robbie cup is uh, it's on the crazy. Cup because we are in in a different country every weekend um for the whole winter so it's kind of a whirlwind um but we do for the most part go to the same venues every year and so um as someone who's been on the circuit for a while now you have like 
you know, there's the places that you just love and the places that you just dread. And, you know, I, I mean, that's just like a part of it. But, um, you know, even the places that you dread, there's usually like you know, some funny stories that you can laugh about at some point um, with them. But for me personally, my favorite places are in in Central Europe uh, in the mountains. I just thrive off the mountains and it tends to be pretty sunny down there too. Um, and the food is just so good. Um, I think one of my favorite places to race is in Italy because um, they really do have it all. They have mountain sunshine and good food. And it's just hard to beat those three things. Um, uh, but my actual favorite place to race is in Switzerland. Um, I also like growing up in Utah, um, I really enjoy racing at altitude. I think I have like an advantage over over the field when we're at altitude. So that's kind of like my niche thing, I guess, in, in racing. Um, and it, you know, altitude's a big thing for endurance sports, like figuring out how to perform at altitude. And so that's like kind of one of the skills I have in my back pocket. So I tend to like being in, in those kind of locations, which are all more or less um, Central Europe. And the thing that I love the most about Central Europe is that, um, well, Europe in general just doesn't have the same like liability issues that the U.S. has. So in the Central European towns, um, like all of them have these, well, they're toboggan runs, a sled run um, that they groom. And they'll be like, like one I did in Austria was seven kilometers long. Like it's, it's no joke. Like you're going seven kilometers down a mountain on a sled. And it's just like a free for all. Like there's no rules. Like everyone just goes at the same time. Like people are just, it's crazy. Um, and you can be just going so fast and I like sledding. I don't know. I mean, I guess it kind of is an Olympic sport for like skeleton luge and bobsled, but like, man, if I wasn't a cross country skier, I'm definitely a part-time sledder. Um, I, I like love sledding. So that's one of my favorite things to do. Like, um, when we're not skiing, um, just like find the local, uh, sled run and some places you have to hike up to the top of them and but a lot of them are like gondola access or lift access or whatever and so it's just like a super fun thing to do and i really wish america could uh lose some of the liability and get behind it because it's really really fun and on the world uh on the world cup is the dev <laughs> you know when she talked about her favorite places and then like the food that's pretty much the epitome of what makes the meats our the meats we go to our favorite, you know, because pretty much everywhere we go in Europe and Asia is, is, is way different than what we're used to and pretty amazing in, in, in the sense of like sightseeing and experience. And we're always in the summer. So the weather's nice. Um, but like, you know, most of the meats we're like, Oh yeah, we're going to go to this place. The food's great. Or we're like, Oh, we're going to this place, <laughs> the food. But, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call anybody out. <laughs> but when we had Natoya on, she said the same thing that you did. You know, she had her her PB in Monaco, so she loves Monaco. Mm -hmm. I think she loved Monaco. Anyway, no, she like yeah, Monaco is great. I mean, the food there is great too. So the food's great. Yeah. <laughs> so is it is it a combination of the food and your performance? Is that really it? Is yeah, I mean, right. Like if I say like, what's my favorite meat? I'm going to say the the meat in Zagreb. Exactly. One, one I ran my twelve nine there, and two. It's always the end of the year, so like they kind of they kind of do it up, right? It's like one of the later yeah. meets in the year, so the post meet party and like just festivities is kind of like you know every, all the athletes are kind of a little bit more like relaxed, and we're like going to eat and drink and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more like, like goodbye, vibes. Off, yeah, good, good vibes, blowing blowing off a little steam. The uh, so perfect timing. I see Logan right here, so I think we should bring Logan in. Yes, yeah, yeah. it will be good to ask her, ask her that too, because that you know I'm sure she has some insight. Yeah, she sent along some some videos too, so we'll we'll find a way to to weave that in. So we'll we'll bring Logan in now. The um, well, this is fun having her back on, um, especially with this with this big win. Oh my my lighting isn't very good. I'm gonna move. I'm gonna turn around. Yeah, just turn around. The lighting's key. Where are you coming to us from, Logan? I am back in Park City, still here after our event. You, you never you, know uh, where you guys are going. So you know, yeah. Are you, are you heading to Whistler for the next event? I am not. So this was my last event of the season. So it was great to, to pull off a good, a good Go last on top. 
Yeah, exactly. That's how you do it, really. Like, I mean, I know you can't plan your season that way, but it would be great just to, you know, come out with a dub and be like, all right, I'll see you guys next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it worked out. So, um, yeah, I, I am going back to school this spring. And so it just it worked out for me to have this be my last one. And um, I am will be cheering for uh, the girls and guys going to Vancouver and Lake Placid, but um, not going myself. So I, I do have to ask you, though, um, Logan, so this is your first Continental Cup win, correct? Yeah. And so what were you thinking? What? Well, I so I was in third after the first round. Um, and so, but I knew it was really tight in points. Like, I think I was in third, but I was only five points away from first. And my first round jump was okay, but... Um, like I had done the one thing that my my coaches and I talked about when we we're like we're not gonna do this we're gonna avoid it and I I so basically what I was working on was um it's you have to be smooth and fluid on a ski jump and I sometimes when I'm trying really hard and I want to go good I have a tendency to be kind of tight and close everything down with my upper body and so I was like I'm not gonna do that this time I'm gonna be relaxed and um instead. I did that. So I knew, I knew I could make a lot of improvements on my first jump. And so when I was at the top, my goal was to just do what we had talked about with my coaches and just be relaxed and flow into it. And I did it and I did. So I still had to wait two people to go behind me after my jump. Um, and so I knew I, I just was happy that I had had a good jump and it ended up putting me on the top step. So it was just nice. You know, Devin's become a total expert. So I'm, I'm just, gonna shut up and turn it over no, you yeah. well you know it was, so it was crazy me and me and billy actually did the live stream show on saturday so we watched the events live right and what's what's cool you know as a fan of the sport now because now i know about it and a fan of yours because i know you i'm like oh she she jumped over 90 meters let's like let's freaking go <laughs> right yes. and, so, and, and then billy's like okay well you know there's still some points you know like style right like how you land and stuff like that i was like well she just jumped the furthest. Like, why? Why wouldn't she just win? She's like, well, they take both, they take both distances and kind of give you like a cumulative and like they. I was like, ah. Oh. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I've talked about because I have like some a lot of friends in other sports and um, especially the freestyle sports. They often will do like a best uh, like two two at your best two out of three or you do take three runs and take your best one or they reset and stump something like that and so for a lot of people it's crazy like but your your second jump was so good um and you're like well it takes two so that's what we always say in ski jumping you got to put two together and um i did got to do it on saturday which was great um and yeah like it, it takes to tr you get two to count you got to do them both so n no room for error in that one thing I have a question about, and I'm getting pretty technical because we talked to Grant after the competition. He said that the uh, the, the jump itself was pretty soft. Um, you know, so I want you to go in detail a little bit more about that. And then two, um, talk about the the adjustment that was made between the first and second runs because you know I and I was I didn't know this until I learned on Saturday that sometimes they move the gate you know, in order to like, cause you know, the, the goal is to jump like 90 meters or 85 meters or, you know, and the good jumpers are jumping over 90. Right. So yeah. Can I kind of tell us about the one, the soft track and then two, how you made adjustments with that. And then, and then how, uh, you know, how you prepare with the new gate change going to the next jump. Yeah. So I'll start with your first question. Um, and so Park City has a natural track, which is kind of unique in um, the ski jumping world. These days, a lot of places that hold World Cups and Continental Cups have what we call an ice track. So um, it's it just like they have a cooling system underneath it. And there's just like a thin layer of ice on top of metal that um, they have really good control over. And they like mm -hmm. create that just for it. And then it gets covered. Um, but in Park City we have just a natural snow track that then it has liquid in it. Um, and so we have to build that like with the snow each year and fill up the track and then, and then press the track. And we have a hill crew that's just like, they're awesome. And they work really hard to make and cut a really smooth track. But 
that means when the weather is funky or it gets warm, like you don't have as much control over the track itself. Um, and so on Saturday, for example, it was really warm in the day and the track was in the sun, which meant that it got kind of soft mm -hmm. and that can be dangerous if then the, the walls of the track, if you happen to be pushing out a little bit, can blow out and then then there's no track that you're sitting in and stuff like that. So we they the hill crew had to be really on top of it and trying to like deal with the weather earlier affecting the track even once it got cooler at night. And so that's kind of the what ended up happening with the track was the the vertical was pretty fine, but then once you got through into the table, um which is where you got to start pushing, everything mm -hmm. kind of slowed down a little bit because it was where everything had, had softened and pooled. And so you had to make kind of an adjustment to start a little bit earlier. Otherwise you're going to get sunk and pull back. And um, it's definitely, it added some character to the competition. I think people who are really used to not jumping with very much adversity, just have perfect tracks, perfect conditions all the time, definitely struggled um, on Saturday. And then Sunday was just a blizzard. So <laughs> same yeah. kind of similar deal. Yeah, that's but, crazy. I feel like an expert because Billy was talking about he was like going really in depth. He was like, oh, their skis were hanging a little bit. You know, is there like a downwind now? And I was like, what are you talking about? How do you know that? <laughs> you know, he's talking about the wind changes and like yeah. on, on the results screen, right? There's a wind gauge that kind of adjusts your point scale based on how far you jumped as well. So I was like, man, I'm in these last two hours, I feel like I could I could uh I could call a ski jumping competition. I yeah, mean, obviously actually. I don't I don't know like all I know now is like an 80 meter jump is like kind of the, the gold standard and then you go well, 80, 90, 90. Would be yeah like, like i think the like everyone's goal is to jump past k um and go yeah. in between that 90 to 100 meter range i think the thing that was tricky with our competitions this weekend is with the track being variable and the wind conditions being so variable um we couldn't push the distances quite as much as maybe like when conditions are perfect because if there was a mm -hmm. huge gust of wind then maybe it'd be dangerous or if the track is funky you don't you don't want to be sending people with too much speed um but it was i i was happy to to have a jump past 90 meters i don't know the last time i've i've jumped past k in competition which is something i've been working on um like fear aspect that's something i've ever since i had um surgery like years back i've been kind of mentally struggling with and um so to like get over that hurdle was in in a competition setting i i was really proud of myself for um so that was nice how much that logan how much of that do you know like do you know when you're kind of push off at the end of the jump like oh this is a good jump or wh at what point do you know that this is a really good jump yeah i think for me, a lot of times it's as I'm coming through the curve um, and the pressure starts to build, I can feel if I'm in like a really balanced, good position that I'm going to be able to push from. But you don't really truly know until you're out over the knoll and you can see how much height you have and your trajectory into landing. Like sometimes I'll feel like, oh, I'm in a great position. This is going to be a sick jump. And then I just come over the knoll and it's I'm short and it's not very good. Or sometimes it's the opposite. If there's a lot of headwind, maybe you didn't have like as good technically a jump, but the elements are kind of helping you jump farther. And then maybe you'll be surprised. You get over the knoll and you're like, oh gosh, I have a lot of height. <laughs> and then you have to kind of handle that. So it's not really until you get out over the knoll and you can see the rest of the landing hill that you like kind of have a gauge of how far you're going. So all of this though, Devin, you know what it's making me think of? Take a look at this, you guys. It's making me think of this. Is this going to play for us? Let's see. Oh, it's oh you, have, you have to play in your player. Oh, you do? Okay. Oh, if I click it myself? Can you click it yourself? It's like a, uh, it's giving a playback error. Let me try it again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, bummer. It played for me earlier. That's so weird. I was well, trying hey. to load up your video, Logan, that, that of your, the formula. Oh, that yeah. That program. Because it, you're calculating this in your head, right? You're like, I mean, obviously it's all, it's so much instinct at this point and, training but at some point all that factors are going through your head as you're flying through the air not that i mean you're making some adjustments but at that point you're kind of at yeah. the whim of your body and the flight and the elements right 
for me, like I'm very much, my coaches would tell you, like I overanalyze things too much and I'm an overthinker and maybe it would be better for me to not do that. But I really like to kind of overanalyze outside so that when I get to the actual jump, I can just do everything on autopilot. So if I've thought about all these things and thought about trajectories and thought about like wind and like where my hands are going to be in the air and what like different angles and things like that, I you don't have time in a real ski jump to be thinking about all of those things at once. But I maybe it just is like a placebo making me feel better. But I feel like if I've thought about all of those things outside of the ski jump and I've spent hours like at home going over all these scenarios then when I actually get on the jump somewhere in my subconscious like I'll be able to just do everything the right way which sometimes works sometimes it doesn't (laughs) no that's that's so true that's that's kind of how I feel on on competitions I like meditate and think about everything to, to go right so by the time I get to the competition you know, it just happens, you know, you, I kind of black out and this is, it just flows. You get in like that euphoric state. Yeah. You know, okay. Well, I just, I have a question for you, or I guess for both of you, but like, I feel like some people preach that you should, you should only ever like visualize and imagine yourself doing everything right. Um. So then like, cause if you are thinking about it going wrong, then it, then you're practicing it going wrong essentially. But sometimes I feel like if I, if I envision all the possibilities, like envision something going terribly wrong and then figuring out how I'm going to deal with it then if that doesn't go wrong in a competition then I already know so what do you think like do you only visualize yourself succeeding and winning or do you visualize the like the adversity as well and figure out how you're going to deal with it ahead of time that's Logan, interesting. Logan you're going to take over this show this, yeah. is, this is one of the better questions that we no have. that's that, that is an interesting question I guess my point of view is when I visualize things I'm not even visualizing like per se the win I just like put myself in this vacuum it's just me and then I'm just like visualizing just doing just go doing like I don't even think about even perfect technique or whatever I really just think like rhythm in my head especially for the the hurdle event right it's like you know jump step and step jump step and step and so and sometimes I can be thrown off too if I'm meditating with like you know headphones and listening to like zen music or like listening to regular music the beat of the music can throw me off I'm like man this race is taking longer than it usually does, <laughs> you know, or, or it's way faster. Um, so no, I don't think I necessarily visualize all the, all the outcomes, although in training, that's a good thing about doing my event, right? Like in you, in you, of course, you actually jump in training and I actually hurdle in training, right? That you practice so many different scenarios. You kind of practice chaos, yeah. right? You're like, Oh, if I hit the jump weird, like how do I, you know, if I get, turn how do i how do i adjust or for me right like if i hit a hurdle how do i adjust so you practice those scenarios so many times that when you get to a competition you have done it before so if it does happen you know what to do like you don't yeah. you know, well you probably panic like i panic yeah. but <laughs> panic like oh i've done this before i can fix it <laughs> yeah so. i think for like for us we like visualization is such an important like tool for us because you can only take so many jumps and we only mm-hmm. get so many sessions and there it's so short that like, if you want to double or triple your training time, like using that mental, like visualizing imagery, stuff like that can be really important. And like a lot of times I like the wind is only like once per year, like the way it was this weekend or something like that. And so, mm-hmm. and you can't control that. So, um, like you, you, you especially because the elements play such a role in our sport, I feel like I've, really kind of latched on to visualizing maybe adverse scenarios or things that aren't really going my way or I don't really enjoy because be, since they're kind of environmental things, we don't necessarily get a chance to practice that actually on the hill. So practicing in your mind is, I don't know. I That's how I rationalize well, it to myself. Well, that's, well, that's to your advantage because you're probably one of the few athletes that actually does that. So you don't freak out as much when it does happen, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go that far. Yeah, but you can say like in competitions, right? Say, you know, for, for my thing, we run in the summer and one of the meets is like 30, 40 degrees and raining. Like people are going to be freaking out. Like, oh, it's cold. But, you know, I went to college in Oregon and I trained all the time in the cold and the rain outside. So like, oh, I can handle that. Right. So like it's yeah. kind of the same thing with you. If you visualize like, you know, a bad wind and a bad wind does happen, you're like, yeah, I've done it before in my head at least. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I need to practice more because every time even so, I'm like, oh, well, that was, didn't go quite as much as I thought. I think the more experience, especially in ski jumping, since you don't have, since things happen so rarely, like the longer you do it, the bigger set of experiences you've had. And you can say, oh, this was like that one time in 2018. And like, I know, I know what this feels like versus I still feel like I'm, I'm older, but I, I I feel like I'm still young enough in my career that there, there are conditions that'll show up and I'll be like, oh, I've never, I've tried to imagine it, but I've never experienced it before. And I feel like that's where veterans have such a, a advantage in weird condition days is that like you, you gathered all these experiences and you can like really rely on that experience that you've, you've had already. For sure. How do you guys as elite athletes, how do you guys um, think of harnessing all that talent, all that practice, all those reps, how do you, how do you harness all that for one moment? You know, and, and both of you, once, like for Logan, once you are on that bar, you're going down the hill. And Dev, once you get in those blocks, you're going through, you know, over those hurdles. How do you guys harness that kind of mental energy in, for that moment? I think it was a good question because I don't think I've totally figured it out, but I think it like you have, it comes down to a lot of trust in yourself. Like I, I think you can't think about it all at once or it's, I think Devin, you were like kind of getting towards like a flow state talking about when you, when you were going through your hurdles earlier, or I can't remember exactly how it came up, but I think like you really do need to be in like a, I've done the preparation, my body knows what to do. And like, maybe I have a few mental cues that I know will help me whatever I'm working on. But just like trusting that the work you put in, all your knowledge, all your experience can pull you through. Yeah, no, that's exactly, that's exactly the same kind of uh, outlook I have and kind of the techniques I use. The one I use specifically for my event, right? Because there's always a, you know, before the race, they always say runners to your blocks, or, you know, whatever. So we, you know, that's pretty much starts right when they say that. So in training, I like to like squeeze my right fist before I do a rep, you know, I just kind of like, right. And so like, it's kind of sets me up to like lock in on the rep, you know, hopefully good, but it's not all the time. Good. But wait, what do you mean when you say rep? Sorry. Like, like a, like a training, say I have like five, five training, like, reps in a practice like i go over the hurdles five times okay so it's practice. specific to the your event like yeah specific to like my like day so say say a hurdle day i'm hurdling i'll do like five repetitions of going over 10 hurdles yeah. so you know with like 10 minutes in between so before i do a rep i i kind of like and then when i get to a race i do the same thing so then kind of like put you in that mental like all right i've done this i've done this a thousand times like there's nothing to think about now except for a few mental cues, right? The same thing you do is like, all right, I'm in the blocks, like flat back, you know, think I about do a flat back too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So think about pushing, you know, dorsiflex into set and really just once the gun goes, I don't think anymore, but you know, doing all the thinking right before you take off, you yeah. know, and for you, it'd be pushing off the bar. Um, yeah, that is, it's very similar. All like, I don't have like that necessarily cue, but uh, like our train, like our, with the way you get your equipment on is the same every time, whether it's in training oh, yeah. or competition. And so like, that's kind of a similar thing, but then I also will like, right before I get on the bar, I'll think through my like few things. And then once you get on the bar, it's like totally deep breath, see the green light and go. Um, so yeah, but once you're in it, you you don't have time to think. Like you're just, it's too much to. You, if you're thinking, right. it's probably not going to be a very good. I think you should bring the knitting uh, up on the hill. Which... <laughs> you probably do. I, th I think. <laughs> um. Yeah. This I learned to knit when I was young with my um with my mom, and this this the like sound to this was some TikTok sound about women not having hobbies. And so I then, but the only hobby women had was knitting. So I just decided to to do a bunch of hobbies, but knit at the same time. So I don't actually have any hobbies. All my hobbies are just knitting, according to <laughs> TikTok. That's hilarious. That's it funny. Um, you, you said you you mentioned your you know your routine and and getting into routine with a uniform. Do you have any like nervous habits or superstitions? Like I'll give you an example for mine. Like 
I have such a weird, like nervous habit of just retying my shoes over and over. Mm. Like I literally put my spikes on, do a rep, and then like, oh, this spike feels just a little bit too loose. Like, let me retie it. And I'm like, oh, this one's a little bit too tight. Let me retie it. And I'll be doing that like, you know, five or six times leading up to the the actual race. And I'm people just see me on the ground, like tying my shoes over and over. <laughs> Have, wait, have you ever like accidentally been like been late to something because you were retying? No, no, no. Okay. Like okay. it's not. It's never that big a deal. Like I've yeah. I've gone where I'm like, oh, my shoe doesn't feel perfect, which isn't like it's not like perfect in the sense that like I need to retie it mentally in my head. Like I'll just pull on the laces a little bit. Yeah, just yeah. Um, you still won races doing that, right, Dev? Where it's like it it wasn't perfect. I I'm still sure I've won races with my shoes untied. You know, like. <laughs> yeah it's just like a nervous like it's my whole my whole since i've been running club track i always did that like i would just like i have pictures of me on the ground like at the starting blocks tying my shoe that's funny um i have i do have a, a specific way i like my shoes tied or my boots tied um mm -hmm. at like a specific tightness and if if it's not right in training i'll take a jump and i it, i won't enjoy it as much because i'll get set in my inner and i'll be like oh i didn't tie my boots quite right but um and i always kind of feel like my best jump is the second one after i've tied my boots so like in training i'll take a jump and they'll be just like tiny bit too tight and then they'll settle into the perfect amount um by my second jump so that means in competition I'll tie my boots earlier than a lot of people do so that like, I feel like they'll settle a little bit. I won't take a jump in them, but like I'll have them settle a bit, which is, is kind of maybe a ha nervous habit superstition, but my real, like I have a competition like set of clothes that I wear. And even if it's like, so I have the same socks, same like spandex shirt, uh, <laughs> the sports bra, like I have a, like I will wear the same ones and th those are my competition clothes that i know i'm going to be wearing under my jumpsuit so dev your day i want to hear about your days and this this is a tweet that you guys did for uh, usa nordic um which the photos get a little tiny but you're on the podium there so uh, actually I, I saw your post on instagram saying that you were still the shortest one even on top of the podium <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I I was somehow like even though I was standing on the taller step, I still wasn't the tallest uh person. And Nina Lucy, who was second yesterday, is a, quite a bit taller than me, so she still had me beat, even though even though I had yeah, the extra right. height. <laughs> the so when take us through like for regular viewers, not elite athletes, how does your day go? Like both of you guys, like so. It ended up, it was nighttime, right? It, it started, the event started much earlier. It was still daylight, right? When you guys, or at least some jumpers were going, I guess. But yeah, so that was the men's, the men's Nordic did the flip-flop. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. So how we, does your day start? Yeah, just take us through like, you know, competition day. So it, t it totally depends because like Saturday, our event was at night, but Sunday it was in the morning. And so Saturday, um, I had like I woke up at 7 a.m. like was doing all my stuff finished all, all my like morning chores and it was like 10 30 and I sat there and I was like I still have six hours until my competition like what am I gonna do all day um and so for me a lot of times when we have a later competition I'll kind of like set an alarm and just pretend like I don't have a competition until the alarm goes off and then kind of do all my pre-jump routine versus like when we have a morning competition, I'll just do start that as soon as we wake up and do like, I had hip surgery. So I still got to kind of loosen that up and do my hip stretches and um, kind of like start warming up at home before heading to the hill. Um, but when you have a night comp, like if, if you're just sitting there in the morning, like you wake up 7am or whenever you wake up and then you're not competing until 7pm, that's a lot of time to overthink or maybe you overstretch or something like that. So I, I, like to pretend I don't have a competition and in, in the morning part so that I can just like have a regular day and then just kind of start my routine a little bit later. Dev, how about you? How does that work for you? Um, similarly, um, most of our competitions are, are at night. Um, so, you know, especially the big ones. So we kind of, I'm, I'm kind of the same way I get up and then I kind of like, look at the schedule if i race at seven that means like my last meal is going to be like two o'clock i usually eat like five hours before um and i usually shake out right before then so like five and a half hours before which would be like light warm up whatever um but for the most part we just like 
sit around and do nothing just because yeah. like, you know, like being, a, being a runner, my event's not really that strenuous. Um, but we're like, Oh, like get off, get off your feet, you know? So we just kind of, we wake up, have breakfast, like chat and then like go watch Netflix for three hours and eat lunch and then go back to bed and watch Netflix for three hours and shake out and then head to the track. And then, you know, the competition part is a fun part. And obviously, um, you know, there's a preparation for the actual event, you know, warm up and everything as well. But um, yeah, the days look, the days are weird. Some of my, some of my meets indoors have been like 11 AM, which is actually kind of nice because that's the same time I train. Like I train in the mm. early, late, late morning, early afternoon. So I was like, Oh, this is perfect. Like get up, have my coffee, eat breakfast, bam, you know, right to the track and get ready. I am curious because I heard you guys talking a little bit about food and meals like ahead Ooh. of before I jumped on. But yeah. like, so you saying you like to eat, I think you said like five hours before or whatever. But like how, like what if you don't have control over that? Like do you always have control over that? Or what if like, does it, do you ever get into a situation where you're like, I need this food or I need to eat now, but it's the, we're at a hotel and you can't do it or something yeah. like that? <laughs> I'm not that really, that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. For the most part, we do have like access to meals, like especially on a circuit, like they, they feed us really well. Um, but if I didn't, if I couldn't eat five hours before, I'd be okay. I'd probably just like grab a banana, yeah. you know, on the way to the track and be like, oh, I haven't eaten in a while. Like I need to get something in my body. Like I said, you know, the, the, the energy level, obviously you want to have some energy, but like the hardest part of my event is the warm up, like warming up. You know, I spend like an hour and 20 minutes warming up before the actual race that lasts for 12 or 13 seconds. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it is good to have the nice food as a veteran. Now I kind of don't get overboard. Like when I was a rookie on the circuit, I was like eating everything. I was just like, Ooh, I gotta try that. I gotta try that. Gotta try that. <laughs> and now as a vet, I'm like, I gotta keep, you know, do things that I would do at home, like eat the yeah. same thing I would eat. Like just because, you know, it looks good and I should try it doesn't mean I should try it until maybe after the competition. Right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that leads me to a question. Like what's your, where's your favorite like place to eat, you know, in the world, like the, the competition that's, that's had the best food. And I can give you mine because that's pretty straightforward um, for me. There's a meat in Lausanne, Switzerland. Mm. That's like, that's like one, the, the spread is great, but they're really famous for the ice cream that they have like in the corner um, like the hotel is called the Moven pick and they have like a special little ice cream van and the ice cream is a one. So like, that's what, you know, I remember going to that meet every year is like eat the food. Great. Like it's pretty good. Like salmon and all this stuff, but the ice cream is something to remember. We also stay at a Moven pick, but they don't have an ice cream machine. What? So that's, like we need to get <laughs> the with, them up nice. with corporate. Yeah. Um, I, so I'm a vegetarian, um, and I have been for six or seven years. Um, which like different challenges in different countries and different regions, depending on like what they, what they've got. Um, I think the most fun food was probably when I went to Japan. Um, but lo I don't really eat fish either. So that, that was one thing I felt like I couldn't partake in and I really wanted to. Yeah. Um, but I feel like my, the, the hotel, like the, the place you do that has the best food is in Oslo. Like they, the oh, hotel you stay in there has like some, it has a good spread and they have lots of really good vegetarian options, which okay. primo. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to link up and, and get the name of the hotel. Cause I'm, I'm running in a competition in Oslo this year. First time mm. I'm going to go there. So. Yeah, no, it's great. It's a good city. I, I think if I had to pick one international city to move to, it might really? be Oslo. Yeah. I like it. That's, I'm looking forward to it now then. Awesome. well hopefully i didn't oversell it <laughs> no i mean I just, i've never been so i don't know i have no you know i have no idea what to expect yeah so logan what do you have going for the the rest of the year you said this is the last competition you're you're going back so are you going back to school at dartmouth yes i am so i am gonna go home see my family we're all gonna be together for the first time in a while um for a, a week or week and a half and then head back to school um and st start grinding on some studies, which I'm excited for. I think like for me, um, school and skiing are both super mentally challenging in like completely opposite ways. And they really balance each other 
really well for me. And so I think like having that mental break, like a mental challenge, but in a totally different way is just so beneficial to me to like reset, kind of give myself some space. That's cool. Like be, be ready to dive back in on both fronts. That's really cool. And did you, did you notice at the top of the show, I don't know if you were listening, but Rosie Brennan, who we were featuring at the top, she's a Dartmouth grad as yep. well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. lots of there's a there's a good crew of us that um like ski US ski team and then also go to Dartmouth. Um kind of whether you ski at Dartmouth, which I can't do because there's no collegiate ski jumping, like NCAA ski jumping. Um, but like there is for racing and Nordic skiing. So a lot of people will like ski for Dartmouth and then go to the US ski team or do what I kind of do where you're on the US ski team and then you take a term at Dartmouth and then go back and kind of go back and forth and they're great with working that. So like we have a, we have a good crew there, which is really fun to like come back to and everyone goes off in the world and does their skiing. And then in the spring we all come back together. And so it's really fun. That's so cool. You know, Dev, I stole our question that we normally kind of end, end the, uh, the, the interview with. Hey, I started off with, with the, what were you thinking? So I'm going to toss it over to you and say, Dev, do you have a, or we could flip it around as Logan have one for you, but do you have, usually you ask a pretty good, what were you thinking question? So I'm sure you got one in your back pocket or maybe not. No, not really. I mean, I, I really wanted to know just like, obviously it's a big accomplishment to, to win any event at the professional level. And I know that because it's really hard to do. Um, so I just wanted to say congrats, um, you know, in general, just congrats on the first Continental Cup win. And I'm sure, there's going to be plenty more um, in your future, which is yeah. going to be exciting to watch. Hopefully. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think like um, I will say that like to humble myself a little bit, like this was probably one of the easier continental cups um, of the, of the season. We didn't have like as many people when there's one in central Europe, you might get like 70 competitors or something like that. Um, sure. So I won't like, don't inflate my ego too much but you know it's on the books it's an official right. win so i'm am really win. proud of it a but i'm hoping some like you know the next level more people the the you know world cup olympic stage like let's let's get it all going yeah for sure no definitely definitely enjoy it like like bob said a win's a win and you know i i know just at this level of, of talent and af, you know the level you're at just coming by those is difficult you know i know I actually you know i was a pro for six years before i won my first diamond league event which is like our you know kind of like world cup similar mm -hmm. thing and 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 it's kind of crazy to think that because i was already you know u.s champion three or four times like ranked top three in the world but it's just it's just hard to like show up on those competition days and win how'd you, you know? celebrate like, your win what'd you do did you do ooh. anything to celebrate <laughs> oh what did i do Man, I actually didn't do anything because by the time I got my trophy and I was so hyped about it, I had a I had like a four a.m. wake up to uh, to get on an airplane at six. So I was like, I got to go to bed or I'm gonna die. Oh no! But I celebrated later in the year, you know, post like the end of the meets, you know, with yeah. some some drinking, some partying, some clubbing. So it was good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's awesome, you guys. Well, Logan, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Somehow. We ended up filling like an hour, I don't know, 45 minutes with you. And that Thanks. was easy. We Thanks, could have kept going once again. <laughs> so you've already reached elite company coming back for the second time on the show. So, oh, uh, yeah. Where do I get know. like a plaque or like a. Like, I think yeah, the third we, time hey, you do. We, okay. we got to get Mike, we gotta get Mike on that, making plaques to send <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To send like you a, one a t shirt, too, you know, like I, yeah. I was on twice. Exactly. I am the world's greatest TV guest times three <laughs> so, yeah but yeah no thank thank you again logan thanks for being on um you know i want i know it's the same time it's 6 30 or 7 so i'm sure you're trying to wind down and grab some dinner and stuff but we appreciate you being back um and i know the fans are excited to to see this yeah sweet thanks guys thanks for having me it's always thanks. always fun good questions all around the hey. best. good yeah. vibes good vibes see you logan cool yeah, see ya. thanks that was great. Dev, yeah. man, I'm telling you, we just got rolling. I looked up and I'm like, wait a minute. It's it's, it's our hour. 
is our hour is almost off and i'm like you, you usually usually you're in the background saying hey guys let's <laughs> producer bob is wrapping hey let's wrap it up i um, know i i can't get the tweets going when i'm on camera the way i normally can nah, so i right. can get you guys uh take you know take you guys off guard and all that stuff but um logan Man, I mean, I'm telling you guys, all of you guys are overachievers. So here she is going to school. She goes to Dartmouth. It's not, you know, you know, yeah, some slacker exactly. school either. Exactly. And and she's studying some serious stuff too. So yeah, uh, sure. and uh, and like like I said, she's she's competing at a high level. And I hope, you know, and I know I'm saying it, you know, jokingly, but I hope she does take it into account. Like winning a competition at this level is is a huge accomplishment because um, it's just not easy to do. Just you got to celebrate the wins, right? 100%. I mean, this is, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm not on the world stage like you guys, but I'm going to celebrate a win. Well, yeah, I started doing that. And I was telling, you know, I tell that to my athletes all the time, you know, that I coach at the Naval Academy. I'm like, hey, they're like, oh, I didn't run as fast as I wanted to. And I was like, hey, you won. You keep, you keep winning. Yeah. If you won every competition from now on until the end of the year, you're going to be world champion, right? That's just how it works exactly right like you know you just keep kind of climbing up to the the competition level like you know logan said you know maybe the competition there wasn't as many people but you know this one's 20 and the next one's 50 you know she wins that and now she's pushing to a 70 person world cup comp wins that then she's you know she's on the top of the you know podium getting on the podium in the next olympics and that's kind of just how it snowballs so that's it's a great accomplishment and i and i you know congratulate her and i was I'm glad I got to see it live as well, you know, being, you know, doing the live stream this weekend, which it's, is a cool. Yeah, cool I mean, I think it's so, to know her, like, you know. Into know her, that's what I was going to say, yeah. right? I mean, that's the difference maker. And and even you on the on the uh, event show on Saturday, I mean, just, you know, your enthusiasm because you know these athletes, right? Yeah. And this is what we're trying to do at World's Greatest. The idea is to make you guys household names. So by the time we're watching you in competitions, we care right you just yeah, care on a different level if i'm you know we're sweating it man when whenever you get in those blocks we're all sweating it oh for sure and my yeah, wife my and kids everybody the thing. yeah they're like man i get the most nervous out of anything i do in my life when i watch you compete i'm like yeah well i'm i'm definitely not as nervous as you then because i get more nervous watching my friends compete than i do when i compete so i know that go. i know the feeling but yeah let's uh let's wrap it up i want to you know say a quick shout out to to bob for being on um make sure you follow us at world's greatest um on twitter at world's greatest without the vowels w r l d s g r t s t um and then the world's greatest team on instagram i believe That's it. um and then youtube the world's greatest um and yeah i think those are the social media platforms we have you can follow me at devin allen 13 on instagram and twitter Bob, do you have any uh, any social media people that you want um, to follow you at? No, no, we don't need. If you, want to follow, if you want to follow Bob, make sure you follow World's Greatest. That's all. That's <laughs> all we're concerned about, right there, right there. So, so Thursday, before we wrap, so Thursday we're gonna have Taylor Fletcher on. Um, so Taylor actually won his last event ever. He retired after Saturday night, um, and he won that event amazing what what an amazing i can't wait to talk about that that's that's cool well hopefully i'm not talking about it. hopefully brandon or somebody is back brandon's yeah. on spring break and, and me too and hopefully i'm back because i'm going to be traveling either thursday or friday but i think you know regardless i want to make a point to pop in because i am interested in talking to taylor about his competition so that's that's a big that's a big win four-time olympian one of one of the greats of all time that's right i mean that's sure. pretty amazing and so he's back and then we'll figure out who else we're going to have on because it's, uh, I think days before, uh, a competition, uh, World yeah, World Indoors Indoors next week. So we might, we might end up pre-recording someone to be on that. Uh, we have a lot of, a lot of people traveling there, but, um, For sure. yeah, you know, we're going to keep this train rolling, Dev, you know, love it. Love it. Well, great work, buddy. Good show. Um, Thanks to all the fans watching. Um, and if you do, if you're interested in more of this content, there's an archive of videos that you can rewatch as well. So we got a lot of great athletes, a lot of great stories. Um, and that's the thing too, like an hour feels like a long time when we're talking about it, but then it flies by because all these athletes have great stories and they're so interesting. And 
you know, just we want to learn about it. And as an athlete and an elite athlete at that, you know, I'm so interested in all these sports now just because I've become invested in the people that we've met. And just now, like, oh, man, there's so many more things that, you know, are part of this 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 event or this sport that, that I didn't know about before. So it's very cool to learn about. Last thing before we wrap, Devin, did you know that Jessica Beard is uh, moving uh, 26 miles from you in Annapolis? Really? No, I did not know that. Yeah. So we're we're coming down. We're coming down to do some shooting with you guys. Okay, great. So we can film film a few few shows. Yeah. She That'd said it the other day, and she said, "Isn't Devin over there?" So yeah, and we're like, she's like, "Oh man, this could be fun." Yeah. We, yeah, we'll be right up the street. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, my friend. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. Thanks, fans. Appreciate y'all.